All right, good afternoon. We'll get started here. I am uh, welcoming you to the uh, session that we're giving today on data sets and registries related to complex rehab technology. There's really like six of us presenting today, and I'm not going to go through everybody, but um, I'll start with myself. You guys probably know me, uh, Mark Schmaler. Um, and I uh, am at the University of Pittsburgh. This session is actually going to cover a, a big part of a grant project that we've been working on for about two and a half years right now. It's a five year project to look at what a new policy for wheelchairs might might look like the the US Department of or um, National Institute on Disability and Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research. I know that's a long we sometimes just call it Niddler. Um, gave us a, a research grant to look at going forward in the future, what would a what would an equitable policy for wheelchairs look like um, in a in a like a new accountable care model, which is pretty much becoming the norm um, in healthcare in the United States right now. So we we were lucky to get that grant and there's a like four different projects associated to it and some other people have presented on those other projects one is to you know look at how bad the problem is for one and we we've, we've got evidence showing that basically nobody's happy with wheelchair service delivery or funding in the United States so i don't think we need to prove that any further uh, another one is to look at a a a more systematic way of doing a wheelchair evaluation using standardized assessment tools and scoring those tools and coming up with what we're calling a seating and mobility index that would then be used to kind of classify people into what types of devices they might need which right now is based on you know what is your icd-9 code kind of thing this is going to look more of a, a more global functional environmental participation approach to it the second part or the third part which we're going to cover today mostly is looking at what is large data telling us about the, the field of complex rehab. And then we want to take that and put it together into a model of what a new policy might look like. So with that, we're going to have uh, Matt Maceros come up. He's He's been doing a lot of the data work in the background. So he's going to kick this off and give us some some idea of what we or a sense of what we've been finding out from the data and how we might use that as we prepare this new policy. So Matt. Hi everybody, thank you for uh, stopping by. Um, I know some of you people in here are statistics and big data people. Uh, for those that, that aren't, I apologize if I get a little bit too deep into this. Uh, oh, that's right, some disclosures here. I'm just gonna read these uh, verbatim because I am not as familiar with these. Okay, we're going to be good then. Like these. Okay. So the main thing we're here to talk about is big data. And I know this has been kind of a hot topic for a while now. Um, when some of these were published, I think this was around 2018, they said that Every day there is 2.5 quintillion bytes of data that are collected every day. Uh, I do not know if anyone else knows computers better than me. I'm assuming that's higher than tetrabytes. Uh, I don't know what the word would be after that. Uh, but the main thing we're talking about is a lot of data. And specifically, I mean, this, this data could be for anything, for marketing, all types of things. But we're here to talk about healthcare. And Big data for healthcare, we can catch serious illnesses early. Um, we can help save healthcare costs by not wasting resources. There's, there's just so many things that we can do <clears throat> to just help optimize things from a cost basis, from a, a patient uh, happiness basis, and from a patient health basis. So the big uh, thing with, with big data is the, the four, four Vs. Uh, first is volume, uh, the amount of data. And as uh, I was talking about, a, a ton of data that is coming in now from our cell phones, from everything else. Uh, velocity of data, which is the, uh, how quickly we are able to uh, bring this data in, which again, uh, with everything and new technology, we can, 
collect the data and then put it onto you know things that can be accessible very very quickly the variety of data uh, it doesn't have to even just be your typical spreadsheets that you are used uh, used to um, I know uh, another uh, project I'm working on with a different team uh, we're looking at doctor's notes uh, that have been put onto registries and using natural language natural language processing to uh, try to figure out what what we can discover from that because a lot of what's in doctor's notes can be um, a little bit more specific a little bit more helpful than simply ones and zeros or certain diagnoses that would be in other things um oh actually going back so the main thing for the data sets so it's so large or complex the uh, traditional data processing methods are inadequate um I'm curious if anybody else knows this here. Does anybody know how many rows you are allowed in an Excel table? It is, oh man, I don't know if I'm gonna get this exactly right. 1,048,576, which sounds like an absolutely incredible amount of data. But when you start working with things like electronic health records, electronic health records and things of that nature. We are talking tens of millions, if not a hundred million people. And uh, we need a lot uh, better statistical processes to, uh, to be able to analyze these things. And uh, so, sorry, as going back to the four Vs, we also have um, veracity. And veracity is more of how reliable the data can be. And this is where things start to get tricky. Because um, when you look at things, you know, common sense would say certain things such as a simple frequency can tell you a lot of information, which is, which is very true, but they can also be a little bit misleading. Um, you know, if you're trying to figure out, I don't know, something about the population of all of Southern California and you send out surveys and then you look at the data and see that, well, pretty much 95% of the respondents were from San Diego, you're not really gonna have a fully representative group. So that might be a little bit biased. And um, other things, I mean, uh, outliers, trying to figure out people that might, uh, might not fit that might mess up uh, the data. And um, there's there's just a uh, there's a lot of things outside of just uh, jumping in and uh, running some uh, some standard things, even uh, very simple things such as a, a t test. Um, as you get into the the tens of thousands and especially the hundreds of thousands of data points, uh, t tests tend to become significant very frequently. Um, so other things such as effect sizes need to be taken into account to make sure that what you are seeing is truly, uh, you know, making a difference that it is not just because of all of the data that you have. Now we have the, uh, the clinical decision support. So this is just making sure, especially to improve healthcare decisions, uh, we want to get the right information, and that is basically, we, we just want to get reputable information, make sure that uh, the data that we're finding is correct and verified, um, to get it to the right people who know what to do with it, and uh, via the right channels, in, in the right formats, um, whether it's a, uh, a spreadsheet or, or anything else that to uh, communicate this data and at the right time. And the challenges. And well, I kind of went into uh, some of the challenges basically uh, already. Um, but outside of, uh, outside of things like bi uh, possible bias, um, Sorry, there's a, uh, a lot of things that you need to do, just uh, cleaning the data and uh, making sure that uh, everything 
everything looks okay. Like I said, there's no outliers. There's nothing that might skew the data uh, that people might be in one place when you're trying to look at a, a bigger area. And also just the, um, the correct tools to use, the correct uh, processes, because you know, if you have enough people a, and a t-test is going to be significant all the time, it might be worth, like I said, before looking at effect sizes or maybe doing some more advanced models, uh, some regression models to, to take into account some other things and see if uh, your variables are really significant. And I think, Rich, is that you? Yeah, I think that's you. So I would say hello, everyone. So my name is uh, also Rich Shane. I also work with a great team here at Pitt, and I figured I would jump in to do a few of these slides. As, as Mark interjected earlier, this is a bigger project um, that we're going to be discussing. And so, as Mark had Mark, I just called you Mark. As Matt had alluded, um, so we were talking about large data sets, and that's what we're going to dive into. So. Really, um, the website for the project is crtpolicy.pit.edu, so you'll find all the information that we're going to be talking about today um, on this website. Um, all the projects that Mark had talked about from the first one down to the fourth one, but we're primarily going to be talking about the actual data sets. And so, as we had alluded, we have a fantastic team. I think that's the first and foremost when we were awarded this project. Um, the University of Pittsburgh is kind of the anchor point uh, of the funding stream, but we have, like I said, a fantastic team um, of different academic medical centers from University of Michigan, The Ohio State University. Um, again, all three academic centers have assistive technology centers, so we are able to collect data, collaborate on different things and items related to CRT. But not just academics. We know we have to get out into the clinicians. We need to talk to the manufacturers, suppliers, and most importantly, the consumers. And so we are collaborating with United Spinal Association, National Seating Mobility, NCART, Clinician Task Force, um, our Rehabilitation Institute at UPMC, NARTS, Permobile, um, and Van G. Miller Group as well. And so I kind of call this the NASCAR slide because it is ever growing. We are always looking for additional resources to join our teams. I will say, as Mark always says, and, and Dr. DeCiano too, we have monthly calls with every single one of these individuals. And in our monthly calls, we have about 30 or 40 people. We talk about the projects, but we also talk about what is happening in this industry and maybe talking about questions that we need to be further investigating or coming up with different methodologies. So it's kind of a welcome all to the groups. And so obviously we would welcome additional input. And as we talk about the team, the team has diverse backgrounds, so it's not just a one size fits all. We have obviously assistive technology professionals, business administrations, consumers, engineers, and so forth, the traditional PTs and OTs and industries. And I think one, one, one of the ones I wanna highlight is our health information management and systems. So I don't know if Matt actually really introduced himself as well as he should have. So Matt's background is really more as a data curator. And so he has been instrumental on all these data sets and all those rows of Excel spreadsheets and things like that, that we have analyzed over the past two years. And so we have a great team of data curators. I know I saw Gade Pramana somewhere in the back row probably. Um, we also have him as a health systems administrator. So we really have a fantastic team to really answer the questions that Mark and Dr. DeCiano, myself and other clinical teams to be, be able to analyze that data, be able to question the data and how to present that data in a meaningful way as well. And so the individual projects, and so this was what Mark was talking about. We have four unique projects, um, our scoping discovery review. So that's our discovery. Um, so for about the last two years, we have done a scoping review of CRT. Um, that document has been published by Maddie Betts. Um, our second project is the development of a seating mobility index. This is going to be sort of a new outcome tool that will be integrated into electronic documentation template that we're piloting at our three academic medical centers. The third one, I'm hoping why you all are here today, is our data sets and registries that we'll be talking about. And the last one is, what do we do at the end of this project? And so we are gonna be developing, hopefully, a new CRT policy model, and that will be our last slide um, of the presentation. 
So where do we get started? Um, you know, when, as academics and researchers, we wanna know where we were and where do we need to go forward. And so this is just a really snippet of where things were. So the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, they published a report back in 2012 that really looked at our industry as a whole. Um, and what they found was they looked at literature review searches for service delivery, they did interviewed experts. And what they found is that as an organization, we had insufficient research. And again, what we're looking at and piloting in data, we're looking at a very small sample sizes of when they were looking at things. And so for decisions from a payer source, they're looking at hundreds and thousands of data sources, or at least the sample sizes of what they're looking for. And so we were looking at how can we collaborate and make this more meaningful. And so I'm sure many of you have seen this. Um, this is the best practice clinical guidelines from Resna. As Andrea mentioned at the opening, all of the position papers and this specific clinical guidelines can be downloaded uh, at Resna's website. And this is kind of in response to the AHRQ report. And so this is what we consider best practice in the industry. Um, and so I'm not gonna go through each one of the service delivery processes. I think this is very familiar, for, I'm thinking for everybody in the audience, but I do know that this is currently being revised. I think Mark had mentioned that to me, that that's under development. It was done by Mary Shea and, and others back in 2011. So I think this is also due for an update. So we hopefully will hear more about that in the future. So I just wanted to kind of kick this off with a, a quick survey of what we had done about last year um, at ISS. We, we had released an online survey and maybe some of you had taken it. And so we are currently analyzing this survey right now. And I know Tyler from Ohio State, he had a paper session, I think yesterday, had to be yesterday, um, on this specific results. And what we found is our team developed a questionnaire of about 19 items. And when we developed, when we did the scoping review first, we found commonalities and questions that we wanted to further investigate and gather feedback from a you know, diverse stakeholder group. And when we found the 19 questions, we figured 19 questions could be very difficult to analyze. And so what we did is we took the Resna Service Provision Guide and we said, hey, questions one, three, and five make sense to put into the funding and procurement section of the guide. And then we looked at you know, a subsequent of questions here at six, seven, and eight, that makes sense to put in outcome measurement. And so once we fit the questions into the guides, we released the survey and we left the survey out for about three or four months, I would say. And we had over a thousand responses and that is a fantastic number of responses. And what we'd really like to know is of those responses, what were our stakeholder groups? We had sent this to clinicians, which well, I think was 41%, 30% were from suppliers, 24% are from consumers. And so when I go into the percentages, I wanna basically say, and Tyler, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Basically, if we're looking at the first one for funding and procurement, so the first row is at 5%, this is basically saying that 5% were in agreement that things were going well. So the lower the number, the more improvements we will say that we need to, to make. And so as we go through each one of these specific areas, we, I would say, have a little bit of a problem. And I think we all can recognize that problem. And that's why we're here at this conference to hopefully maybe improve some of the areas and also have these open, meaningful discussions about what can we do to improve it. So whether it's funding and procurement at 5%, outcome measurement at 14%, the highest one <laughs> that we'll say here for fitting and training and delivery was still at 42%. So higher number, but still not probably where we need to be in terms of that we're doing something really well. It's, thank you, Mark, still an F. As an academic, that is still an F. We'll, we'll go with that one. <laughs> and so again, when you look at the survey as a whole, let's take a look at the specific responses by the stakeholder group as well. And so this is basically the first row is supplier, the payer, manufacturer, consumer slash caregiver, and the clinician. And can you guys see who is the most dissatisfied of the stakeholder groups? It's basically the consumer or caregiver. If I could highlight that, I probably would. I should have done that before. But, I, but again, so when we look at this, is that this, this is not new information. We, we kind of realize this. But again, if you have power in numbers and you have a thousand responses, that's still a, a pretty good remark. And if we wanted to specifically carve out those 19 questions for that consumer group, we can go into further detail. And I'm not gonna say that right now, because I know Tyler is working on that manuscript right now as we talk about that. Um, another additional to these responses is that we had open comments. 
And I know many of us who are here from the United States, obviously we have just finished up an open comment period for seed elevation, where we had 3,000 comments on the initial, um, obviously, response. Of those 3,000 comments, now CMS has to analyze each one of those questions and comments, right, and put them into buckets. And so we also had close to a couple of thousand. We had 300 responses that our team is now um, analyzing and putting into buckets from a qualitative analysis perspective, and we're working on that manuscript as well, so more to come from that. But again, it's easier when you have large data, you can start asking these other questions on maybe on a bigger scale, or maybe carving out a specific area that you can further investigate, such as the consumers, or maybe it's the manufacturers, or maybe individuals in the audience have ideas on how we can further analyze things as well. So again, this is just kind of a snippet of information that we've been gathering um, on this specific project. And I think we're gonna go right into the data sets and registries. I might turn this back over to you. All right, perfect. So now we're going to uh, talk about some of the projects that we have done recently, look at some figures, try not to get too deep into everything. So first we have the uh, functional mobility assessment in the uniform data set registry. The labor tracker wheelchair repair registry, the uh, UPMC health plan data set. Uh, we also had a national seating and mobility that uh, we got through some partners and uh, the permobile data at the very end we'll talk about. <clears throat> okay, so this, this really isn't saying anything uh, too complex, just how things have changed in funding since 2018. And it, we can see that the biggest thing is that Medicare funding has gone down significantly, about 12%. But Medicare managed care has gone up, specifically Medicaid has gone up, and uh, private insurance has gone down. Also from this, uh, we can see the difference in manufacturers. I apologize, I don't, oh, okay, yeah, it's a little bit brighter up there. You can see the, the light blue line. Um, but I will, I will let you take what you will from these. I don't know if there are any manufacturer people in here, so I'm not going to say much about that. Uh, okay. And uh, now we have a project that looked at ATP involvement with a quite a few outcomes, actually, uh, for, for patients. Um, now, right here, we just have certain FMA scores and... The difference if they had an ATP when they went to get their uh, assistive device or if they did not uh, have an ATP. Now, none of these are significant. They don't mean anything like that. This is just some graphs to, to show you the difference. And I mean, even without looking at significance, you can tell there is a, a pretty massive difference in all of these. Um, also, uh, things that, uh, that we found while doing this project is that um, those who saw an ATP when finding their assistive devices were significantly more likely to have uh, complex manual wheelchairs or custom fitted, I, I apologize, um, as well as um, group three or group four power wheelchairs. Um, okay, yeah, this, this graph might be somewhat difficult to read. I apologize for that. Uh, I did not make this, but um, here, I'll, I'll step out a little bit. So you can see the, the overlap there, you know, whenever it's more of a purple, that just means that that is both of them. Um, but the main thing that this is saying is that when an ATP is not involved, um, chairs just aren't, aren't likely to, to last as long. Uh, most people, usually whenever people have an ATP involved, they uh, they have their chairs last longer. Um, now it seems to, to kind of even out towards the end, but there's not a lot of data there. So I would say I'm not sure if it would be as reliable. Um, and not, not saying that uh, things could be bad. This could also mean that uh, when an ATP is involved, people just get a chair that is better fit for them so they would keep it longer. Okay, 
Now, the uh, functional mobility, employment, and safety benefits of seat elevating devices. Um, so the other ones that we've talked about, I did not really have the chance to work on. This was really the first one that I was a, a big part of whenever we started. So, uh, so the main thing is first we, uh, we tried to look at longitudinal data to see some things. We didn't quite have enough to uh, make too many uh, conclusions from that. So we just observed the baseline data and found that those with seat elevators had statistically significant higher FMA scores uh, going into, or total FMA scores, also higher reach and transfer scores. Uh, they were employed at higher rates. Uh, the big thing, um, as well as they re reported fewer falls. Um, and I don't, I don't know, I think, this was this was more of something. This is a practical thing. I don't think this was from the the stats, but promoting safer transfers, allowing a person to align services so that they are level, thus reducing falls during transfers. And um, just going back, if anybody attended Corey's talk yesterday, uh, reducing falls has a lot of implications, especially in terms of uh, just limiting future healthcare costs uh, that really don't need to be had. Okay, so now uh, we also looked at the timeliness of wheelchair service delivery time. Um, as we can see here, we are looking at an average of about, what, three months, three months and a week for everything. Um, obviously, the more complex the assistive device, the longer it's going to take. That makes sense. But um, for group four power wheelchairs, we're talking for almost five months uh, for people to be, be going out without their device. And even more troubling, I think, is um, the standard deviation. Uh, just because there's a, a standard deviation of 81, th this could mean that there's some very, very high outliers, that certain people might be waiting seven, eight months, up to a year, uh, just to, to have their assistive devices. Um, some other things that we found when looking at these, um, things that make sense, uh, the more complex the chair, the longer it took um, for people who needed custom fitted things. Uh, one interesting thing was that <clears throat> the, uh, the longer the onset of disability, so uh, I guess the, the further away you are from the onset of disability, the longer it took for, the, for people to get their assistive device. So that was very interesting. <clears throat> um, oh, yeah, and, and looking at this, also uh, statistically significant, those who were in Medicaid managed care and in other insurance types were more likely to get their devices faster than other insurance types, whether it be, I think, uh, yeah, I think this was mainly for non-custom fitted manual wheelchairs. And also uh, looking into <clears throat> some power wheelchairs as well. Excuse me. Uh, I don't think that there was anything statistically significant here. Um, we have, let's see. So when Medicaid is the payer, the average was about 76.15 days after the initial evaluation to have a mobility scooter delivered. In comparison, it took uh, just a little over 100 days for a group two power wheelchair, 134 days for a group three power wheelchair, 186 days for a group four power wheelchair when Medicaid was the payer. Uh, this means it took an average of 24 days more to receive a group to power wheelchair compared to a scooter, uh, 34 days more to receive a group three compared to a group two, and 52 more days to receive a group four compared to a group three. Um, this also suggests it took about two and a half times as long for somebody to receive a group four power wheelchair compared to a uh, POV or scooter. And just a look at uh, 
actually, I think we have, yeah, G'day is here. This is a lot of the stuff that G'day has looked at, um, looking at some of the, the, in, um, the repairs that we need. So for manual wheelchairs, the things that are most likely to need uh, repaired, wheels, tires, forks, armrests, uh, leg rests and foot plates, general services and backs. Um, for power wheelchairs, some, uh, some more intricate things, uh, a lot more of the electronics, batteries, cables, uh, still wheels and tires, and then some general services. But we will go into a little bit further with these. So these are uh, the median, reasonable, useful lives of all of these parts. Um, and again, so the, the main reason we're using median, because I know most people are used to averages, is because if, you know, if a part were to fail almost immediately or if a part were to last for eight or nine years, that's really going to throw off the average. So uh, median kind of takes uh, away some of the power that those outliers can change uh, the, the data. and. The air bars in there are just 95% uh, confidence intervals. Um, so showing how, you know, how, how variable it is, not quite a, a standard deviation, but kind of uh, adjacent to that if you, if you think about it. Okay. Now, uh, looking at battery lifespan. So it's some of these, I know pie, pie charts, it can be tough to see some of these things. The main thing is most of these are due to just not holding a charge, uh, almost 90% or the battery's dying. And then a very, very small amount for leaking or those that are cracked or broken. Uh, most of the ones that we looked at with this were uh, group three and 40% had at least one battery replacement out of the 1,268 power wheelchairs that we looked at. The median battery lifespan was 22.3 months after delivery, and the manufacturer was uh, heavily associated with uh, battery life variability, which we will see soon. Uh, we do not want to ruffle any feathers, so these will be nameless. To be honest, I don't know uh, what any of these numbers or any of these letters are, who is who, um, but we can see here that there is a, a very large difference um, especially going into the third year between manufacturer A and manufacturer B and then C and D. Um, but going back into what we talked about earlier with big data, one thing to, to notice about this that, you know, could be a question is the sample size for both A and B combined is, is kind of small. Um, maybe, maybe if we collected more data on this, we would see numbers that are closer to C and D. Maybe not. But uh, something to think about always is, trying to, to get as big of a sample as you can and make sure that everything is taken into account. So we also looked at how long uh, wheelchair motors lifespans last. Now there's a lot more uh, reasons that they might not have worked in here. Uh, I don't think I'm going to go through this pie chart. You can <laughs> see for your, for yourselves. I know uh, some of the smaller ones, it's, it's hard to see, but um, so we looked at, again, 1,268 power wheelchairs. 14.8% had at least one motor replacement, and they last about a little over three years. And as we'll see again, there is a big difference when looking at the manufacturer. And again, I do not know which manufacturer B is, but they are killing it compared to everyone else, especially with this almost doubling how many make it into the third year which is which is incredible uh considering how how uniform the rest of them seem to be like right around 50 percent um i mean this could be for for any amount of reasons but the uh the log rank test supported significant differences in motor survival probability um you know it, it is important to to run some some tests with this, I mean, it, you, you'd think 95 over 56 is going to be significant, but uh, to get that number, it's, it's only with a probability of 0 0.022, so not as significant as you might think. And I think that is the end of what we have done, at least the first four, before we go into uh, Permobile. Yeah, if you want to go.
to take questions. All right, fair enough. Oh, I will say, uh, I think I mentioned it real quick before I'm done, but I did not do all of those. I, there was only one project that I fully worked on. So if you have questions about some of them, I will do my best to answer, but I might not know everything that went into them. All right, thank you. And this is uh, Carla to talk about uh, the Permobile data. Thank you, Matt. My name is Carla Noya. I work at uh, Permobile as a senior researcher at uh, R&D based in Sweden. And um, this is the data that we collect. So uh, the, the Permobile connected data, and this is the data setup. So we see there on the left side, the power wheelchair that has uh, different sensors in it, uh, like an odometer and sensors that will tell us how the actuary actuators are being used uh, and uh, via connect me unit that is placed on the wheelchair uh, we collect we collect the data it goes uh, via bluetooth it's connected to a my per mobile app that uh, people have on their in, on their phones and via that app if they of course agree uh, with the terms of use they are able to see their own data how far how far they drive and uh, how often they change uh, positions uh, and uh, if they uh, uh, consent to use uh, and share their data <clears throat> to share their data with us for research and the product development purposes, we uh, send the data via cellular network to a cloud uh, where we uh, where we save all our data in one spot and it's and it's big data, we will get back to that later. Um, and uh, in that system, we also have the ability to connect to voice assist as well to uh, fleet management there on the right side, which is then for wheelchair providers or service providers being able to remotely follow their wheelchairs from uh, from a service perspective and doing proactive action, for example, when they when they would see that there are problems with a battery. So this is the data that uh, we collect. Um, we have event data, um, turning the chair on and off, uh, error data, charging data. We have data from an odometer uh, that uh, gives us the distance that people travel. That is mainly what we will talk about today. Then we have data from the different activators and how they are, how they are being uh, used. Uh, so we know you know different angles uh, that people are sitting in and then uh, they are all time stamped so we know uh, when they are doing that and for how long and then we have battery data um, in terms of state of health and state of charge of the battery and um, we also collect we don't collect now i say it in the wrong way um, uh, the, the GPS is connected, so people will be able to, to use that via the MyPromobile app, um, but we actually don't store this, this data for uh, privacy reasons, um, obviously, so, so we're not able to look at that. The data is uh, anonymous, so we don't have any data on user characteristics, on, on their diagnose or age, uh, or, or all of that. We do work together also with um, uh, different university projects where, where we will be able to share those data and, and uh, make those links. Uh, if you want to see a good example of that, there is a <laughs> session right after this where um, uh, the, the uh, how do you say that? The, um, the the where Leonie will be presenting her her data there um and um we are, we do not have a direct measurement to determine if user is sitting in the wheelchair just a disclosure there so we like to think of it as insight from two perspectives on the one side the user behavior insights to get insights into how devices are being used and on the other side, in uh, wheel performance insight to more get insight in how devices are functioning, mainly looking at the, at the long term uh, and doing longitudinal data anal analytics. So the data that we will be talking about today uh, is from activated wheelchairs uh, with consent, um, the, where we have in total um, almost 8,000 wheelchairs. If we look at the people that consent to share the data for, for research uh, and development purposes, it's it's around 10% who uh, does not consent. So we have a we have a good uh, percentage of, of of chairs that we can look at there. 
Um, then we excluded the demo chairs um, uh, as there will be no, no users in it. And then um, we excluded some chairs that we didn't have data from in 2022 as that is the period that we looked at. Uh, and we finally included then 7,168 uh, people. And just to, to make a reference to what you were saying earlier, Matt, I was trying to, <laughs> trying to download this data the other day in Excel sheets, and then it was 155 Excel sheets. So with your 1 million rows, I guess we can call it big data. <laughs> so these are the questions that we looked at. So first of all, what was the mean daily distance that individuals traveled in their power wheelchairs in 2022? And then is the distance different between regions and if it's different between wheelchair models? So, just to give you the statistics of how uh, many chairs we had in the different regions, um, it's a US, USA uh, dominated, so we have 71% of the chairs being, being in the US, then we have 4% in Canada, 7% in Australia, and 18% in Europe. And uh, when it comes to the different wheelchair models, we have um, our mid-wheel uh, three series, uh, 44%, mid-wheel five series, 6%, and then we have our F3, 26, F5, 5%, and F5 Corpus VS, 18%. So that will be the standing wheelchair. So here are then the, the results showing how, uh, how far people travel. Um, so this is for um, summarized for all the different months of 2022, and we will we see the daily daily distance um, averaged over the month, and um, we see clearly seasonal trend right where people travel more during the summer months um, than during the winter months. So it ranged from 1.45 to two kilometers, which is 0 0.9 uh, between 0 0.9 and 1.3 miles. This is really just another way of presenting the same data, but instead of instead of doing a monthly summary, now we have a weekly summary, uh, and we did this to highlight that you see in in red, you see the Sundays, so you see the dips there that that occur, just to show that you um, people drive drive less uh, distance on on Sundays, and then of course we don't have the the the, the data to answer why that is, uh, if it's uh, because they rest or they have they have less assistance. Uh, it could be many bunch of reasons there. Already then the next question was to see if we see differences between the regions. Uh, so this is a little bit small, so I'll talk you all through it. Uh, in the, we have for every region, and this is still the same graph, right? We have the whole of 2022, and for every region we have a different color. So we have the US there in blue, and um, you see that the blue line uh, for US is all during the whole year on the lower end there um, compared to the other regions, and we don't see as much as seasonal variation. Then we have Canada, which is the orange line and comparable to the US in the winter months. It's quite comparable to the US in the winter months, but then you see during the summer that there is that they travel a further distance. If we focus in on the green line there, which is is Europe, we see that they are they are on top of the on top of everything during the whole year. So they, they have the most distance overall. And lastly, Australia, which is the red line we see in inverse seasonal shape, obviously, since since it's on the, on the other side of the world as all the other regions, um, they, they have the least distance from from June to October uh, as it's their winter months. Here I just summarized these uh, statistics um, in uh, the mean distance over the whole year, and I ranked them, them uh, by who had traveled the furthest. So it was the largest distance was for, for Europe with uh, 2.7 kilometers or 1.7 miles, and the least distance was for the US with 1.6 kilometers or one mile per day. So we can say that individuals in the US in the in the EU travel 1.7 times more compared to those in the US. Then the next question was the difference between the different chair models uh, and here 
we see uh, again uh, the different models colored in uh, colored in different uh, colors uh, and uh, we see F3 is our blue line, M3 is the orange line and F5VS is the green line uh, and we see that they are lower compared to the other models in particularly in the summer right these lines are the line these lines are more flat uh, and then we see the F5 and the M5 um, F5 being the red line and M5 being the purple line, they are higher compared to the other models, in particularly in in particularly there in the summer, they have a more distinguished seasonal seasonal effect. Um, uh, so we can say that uh, these these F series, in particular the F5 and the M5, they seem to travel further, uh, and uh, uh, we we don't we do know for those who are who are, who are not. Uh, uh, where that the, those are typically chairs that travel uh, faster, that are, have the ability to go faster and have better suspension compared to the tree series. So here I did the same thing as for the region. So rank them uh, by the who had traveled the furthest. So here uh, it was the M5 Corpus VS chairs that have traveled the, the, the furthest uh, and with a mean distance of 2.3 kilometers or 1.4 miles uh, on average per day during the year. And the least was the M3 corpus then with 1.5 kilometers or uh, one uh, mile per day. So individuals in uh, the M5 travel 1.5 times more than those in uh, M3 chairs. So just to uh, summarize here and give you the answers to the question that we posed in the beginning, uh, what was the mean daily distance that individuals traveled in their power wheelchairs in 2022? So it was between 1.5 and 2 kilometers or 0.9 and 1.3 miles. Is this dis distance different between regions? Yes, it is. Individuals in the EU travel 1.7 times more than those in the US. And is the distance different between wheelchair bottles? Yes, it is. Individuals in the M5 travel 1.5 times more than in the M3. Yeah. Uh, thank you, caller. So you can kind of see that a lot of the data sets that we had talked about um, a little bit today, it stems from the registries that we had talked about. So that FMA wheelchair repair repository, um, a lot of the data was analyzed from that, and that was through the corporate research agreement with the Van G. Miller. So just want to say thank you to Greg Packer. A lot of the wheelchair repair registry um, came from labor tracker um, data from US Rehab as well. But we also want to say thank you to Dave Peterzak at National City Mobility. Um, we were able to have de-identified wheelchair repair registry and a lot of other associated variables from, from NSM. Um, so I want to thank them as well. We are in constant communication with our own health plan at the UPMC, um, and we'll talk about that in a second. And obviously the collaboration that we have with Permobile as well. And so just want to say thank you to Carla and Karin as well, who are also part of our team. Um, I'm going to ask Dr. DeCiano to come up and we'll talk about the last slide here about kind of what is the next step with the model. Thanks, Rich. Uh, I'm Brad DeCiano. I'm a physiatrist uh, in our clinic here at the Center for Assistive Technology. And my job is to talk about the fourth uh, project in this grant, um, which is really how do we take the research and come up with a new policy? How do we make recommendations for what a new policy would look like? And so there have been several presentations today about different projects. There have also been presentations from our group throughout ISS. Um, yesterday. And so if we look at where the problems are, where do where do the problems occur? Where do consumers have the most dissatisfaction? We have ambiguous guidelines and double standards. We have issues with provider and reviewer qualifications. We have long wait times. We have problems with repair services and supply chain. We have limited consumer training on use and maintenance of devices, and we have problems with follow up. And part of the problem here is that our policy to date has really been evolved from trying to manage waste, fraud, and abuse instead of trying to enhance the client experience. And if you look at 
what high value healthcare is supposed to do, it's supposed to achieve the quadruple aim. High value healthcare improves health, enhances client experience, reduces healthcare costs, and minimizes clinician burden. So that's really where a policy change should be made so that we can start to achieve those end outcomes. And ultimately, CRT policy should align with civil rights legislation. So it should al align with legislation like the Americans with Disabilities Act. So what are our, some specific recommendations that come from some of the projects that we've seen so far? Well, number one, the policy should really be based on all components of the wheelchair service provision guide. Um, we showed all the components of that earlier in the presentation. And so we must address accountability for each of those sections for assessment, for fitting, adjustments, modifications, training, maintenance, repair, and follow up. And there's better ways that we can address follow up and maintenance through improved payment models and fee schedules improved performance standards, and expanded ways for us to conduct follow-up by supporting telehealth, device connectivity, like you saw with Permabil, and also remote therapeutic monitoring in between visits. Number two, our policy should be less diagnosis-driven. We all know the problem with, for example, group three power wheelchairs and it being so diagnosis driven and we presented a project yesterday on the seating and mobility index, which is a tool that we've been developing to try to demonstrate a person's need for a device, instead of being so diagnosis driven. Number three, uh, we need to remove the in the home rule and double standards. Um, so we all know that there's a no in the home rule with prosthetics and orthotics that should be similar for CRT. Number four, addressing qualifications. Just as clinicians and suppliers have qualifications, so too should policy reviewers and those performing maintenance and repair. And number five, we need to encourage partnerships like we've seen in our projects between academia and the disability community, industry, and policy stakeholders. And some examples of how these partnerships can really be effective are um, looking at, for example, the project that we showed on repairs and breakdowns, we can anticipate now by using data which parts are going to be needed to be replaced at what frequencies. So we shouldn't be surprised and we shouldn't have as many supply chain issues if we can use the data to anticipate those repairs, have those repairs available, have those parts available and in stock. Another example is the value of large databases being able to allow us to collect uh, uniform data sets and develop standardized instruments and tools. So really here, the goal is not in the end to match just a diagnosis code to a device. And I think the way that we achieve real value, real high value healthcare is when people with disabilities are healthy and they can fully participate as members of society. So that's how we're hoping to change our policies by using the data to inform that sort of approach. So thanks. I have one more slide as I know Brad had mentioned about our collaborations with stakeholders. I definitely want to do a shout out to our United Spinal Association. Oh, okay, is that better? So again, I just wanted to make a shout out here. Um, so people may be familiar with the United Spinal Association, um, their government relations with Alex Benowith, along with Jeannie Minkle. They have a survey out there right now that you can search. It's unitedspinal.org backslash wheelchair uh, denied. Thank you. Um, oh, oh, good to see you. I didn't see you. Thank you. Are you sneaking? There you go. Um, so obviously, we just wanted to make sure that everyone is aware of this and to please go to the website, share with your consumers. We definitely want to hear back from them and let them analyze the data to see what kind of parts are being denied and hear the stories because it's always impact by numbers. And so I know this is still active and live. And so we just want to make sure that this is being shared throughout many of the networks here. And hopefully you all can disseminate this um, when you go back home and we can still continue to collect additional data.